So uh, I think we have a packed room, <laughs> completely packed. I'm glad we don't have to use the other uh, little room because it's never quite as nice. So welcome to all, all of you to uh, the Mathematical Institute. This is our second uh, Christmas lecture, uh, ending a very successful uh, year of public lecture. And there is no better way to, to end the year than having uh, Professor Marcus Dusotto uh, with us today. He's the as many of you know, the University uh, Simony Chair of Public Understanding, and it's going to be a real Christmas treat for all of us. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Do we need any more people sitting? Is there anybody we need? I think we're good, actually, for that. Okay. Um, so, before we start, uh, actually, we have a word from our, our sponsor. For the first time, we have a sponsor for public lecture. We started very small. But as we are expanding, we were very grateful to have a sponsor. So I'm, I always wanted to have a radio host show, so I can say a no word from our sponsor. <laughs> our sponsor today is G Research. Um, if you're wondering who G Research is, I'll tell you. G Research is a fast-growing, well-established financial research company located in central London. The quantitative researchers develop ideas to predict return in global markets by finding patterns in large, noisy, and rapidly changing data set. They have opportunities for candidates to apply mathematical concepts to real-world problems in a relaxed yet dynamic environment. So I'm particularly grateful because with the support, we, we're going to be able to expand further our program of public lecture and really bring the best mathematician from all around the world to give public lecture here. So we'll have an exciting program uh, coming. We'll have talks on the mathematics of crime, later next term. We'll have talks on mathematics of toys. We'll have another lecture, I hope, with uh, the, the coming book of Marcus uh, later on this year, and many more coming uh, next year. So we have an exciting program. Of course, tonight is a special night, just not because we have Marcus with us tonight, but for many of you know, it's also the opening night of Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that makes it, of course, very special. And I think there's probably a few of you who came here just to be in a warm environment rather than camping outside the movie theater <laughs> waiting. That's perfectly uh, all right in, in the spirit of intergalactic peace. I think we can accommodate you and, and do a little bit of mathematics in the meantime. But it really made me think, and I said, okay, so th that's good, Star Wars. Where would Marcus fit in a Star Wars universe? So first, we have, of course, to decide who is the dark side and who is the non-dark side, whatever they call it, the bright side or the light side. Well, I, I don't know for you, but for me, it's quite clear. That's an easy one. You know, if you look at the dark side guys, they have, they have all the, the cool gadgets, and of course, they have a, a great sense of fashion. So for me, clearly, the, the dark side is the applied mathematicians. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You, you could imagine a mathematician in a little hut with the little rope solving equation, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have them build a Death Star probably, right? right? Okay, so that's the easy one. Now we have to decide in that universe, we have the dark side and we call it the pure side. Make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> so who would Marcus be? Of course, Marcus is definitely on the pure side. He's, he's a pure mathematician of great renown. He's made important contribution in group theory, in analytic theory of prime number. He's still very active in this field. He received in 2001 the Berkwick Prize from the London Mathematical Society. Clearly, he's very strong. So which one would he be? Well, could he be Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yoda? <laughs> well, I think he's way too alive to be Obi-Wan and, and too articulate for Yoda to be. <laughs> I think it would be, he would make a great Jar Jar Binks, personally, because <laughs> of his ability to entertain people. But if you think about it, the force is strong in this one. <laughs> and in recent years, I've heard Marcus talk about algorithm. I've heard about how useful mathematics is and how it applies to everyday life. I even s saw him talk about units, kilogram, meter, something that pure mathematician would never touch. So I think he's definitely getting corrupted by the dark side. <laughs> so that leaves only one main character 
for me, Marcus is the Luke Skywalker of <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> and maybe he's going to be the one to unite both sides. Who knows? So, but uh, before I ask you uh, to join me, I have to take my uh, laser saber and tell you about the emergency exit <laughs> over here and there and there. We're not going to fight tonight, I hope. But so if you, in case of emergency, you can take any of these exit and you'll end up in open space where nobody will uh, hear you scream, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so a final word for Marcus. Please come, Marcus. Come join me, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure. All right. Um, I actually really enjoy this time of year um, because there's so much maths hiding everywhere. Um, but there's something really weird because um, uh, around my neighbourhood, carol singers just will not come to my door anymore. Um, I wonder why this was. And my, my children explained to me, it's because, Dad, every time they come, you find some mathematical thing in the things that they're singing and they don't come anymore. It's got rounds that... Um, uh, so uh, I've got this captive audience now, so uh, you, you can sing me carols at the end if you want. Um, but I, uh, So what I, I wanted to do was to give you a little bit of the, the things that I bore my carol singers with. Um, um, actually, I live uh, in East London, and uh, so I actually live in quite a, a Jewish neighbourhood as well. And we've just finished um, celebrating all the uh, Jewish families have had... Um, uh, candles uh, in their um, windows because they just finished uh, celebrating uh, Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah is probably the first great uh, sort of mathematical holiday um, uh, of this time uh, because uh, the candles, if you uh, know the story of Hanukkah, it's about the miracle of uh, lights um, and they light candles because the oil that should have only lasted for one day actually ended up lasting for eight days and so they celebrate Hanukkah um, by lighting candles over the eight days of uh, Hanukkah and uh, um, you get these little boxes um, with the candles in um, and one of the uh, challenges they set all the kids is can you work out how many candles are in the box um, because the, the rules are that on the first day um, you light one candle but with another candle which is called the shamash um, so uh, you actually light two candles on the first day of Hanukkah um, and then the second day you light three candles the, the one that's lighting and then you light two more uh, so by the end you uh, uh, you light um, nine candles in total so so that's the challenge you set the kids is well how many candles are there in the box actually it's, it's quite similar it's, it may Amazing how um, you know actually all of these holidays are about uh, the fact that it's really dark out there. They're festival of lights as well. Um, but uh, Christmas also has a kind of version of uh, this kind of challenge as well because uh, some of those carol singers that come round to me, um, they're all singing, you know, on the first day of Christmas, my true love sent to me. Um, and so one of the challenges again is, well, how many presents on each day do you get? And it's a similar sort of problem that you're adding, uh, you're adding up. Well, one partridge in a pear tree, uh, 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 two turtle doves, and things. So you've got these kind of, uh, the same sort of challenge where you've got to add up um, uh, the number of presents on each day. Um, so uh, I always uh, challenge them, okay, what if we, you know, Christmas seems to start earlier and earlier every year. So, you know, what if it actually was, you know, 100 days of Christmas? Um, so I always challenge the carol singers. I think this is why they never come anymore. So, okay, so, you know, what if there were like 100 uh, iPods and 99 copies of Music of the Primes and um, uh, all the way down to, you know, could you tell me how many uh, presents that you're going to get on the, the 100th day of Christmas? Um, and, of course, these, there's a nice way to, to view this because you already saw this kind of uh, triangle building up. So if you stack all of the presents, up. Um, so, for example, you, you know, you've got one down here, and then you've got two turtle. There, so there's a partridge in there, and uh, two turtle doves, three French hens, and four. What's um, yeah, yeah, that's one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so these are actually examples of things called the triangular numbers. So the triangular numbers apply both to counting the number of candles in Hanukkah and also the number of presents you get on each day um, uh, of Christmas. And, and there's a nice way to actually quickly calculate how many presents there are in here. Um, because what you do is you take two of these uh, sort of sets of presents and you slot them together. Um, so if you do that, you get um, a rectangle. And it's very easy to count things in a rectangle. So if I had 100, the 100 days of Christmas, so I stacked all of those presents up and I took another copy of that, I put them together and I'll have a rectangle which is, has 100 uh, boxes down one side but 101 down the other side. 
Um, so that's two copies of what I'm trying to count. Uh, so if I do 100 times 101, uh, I divide that by two, I'll find out how many there are in that triangular set of, of boxes. Um, so that gives you a nice sort of formula, actually, to calculate um, the number of presents you'll get on each uh, day of, of Christmas. Um, but Hanukkah actually has a little trick to it, of course, um, because uh, uh, so you know, you think, oh, right, it's the, it's, so it's the ninth triangular number um, is the number of candles that'll be in that box. Um, but of course, a little trick you have to remember is that there's no first day. So you have to take one off that number because you start with two plus three plus four. So it isn't quite the ninth triangular number. It's the ninth triangular minus the first candle, which never gets used. So, so that's always the trick to see how clever um, the, the, the kids in Hanukkah are. So it's actually, uh, you've got 44 candles in that box. Um, but of course, actually, uh, so that's a kind of uh, nice pro problem. It's sort of a two-dimensional triangle you've got there. But actually, um, I rather like Christmas because uh, uh, there's a little bit more of a challenge inside that problem because yeah on each day of Christmas um, you've got a triangular number of presents but what about over the whole of the 12 days of Christmas how many presents do I get from my true love over the 12 days because then actually you start the problem starts to become a little bit more interesting because um, it's not just two-dimensional so we've seen that triangular numbers give you the number of presents on each particular day but what about over the whole of um, uh, the 12 days of Christmas. Well, the interesting thing is that this is a three-dimensional problem. So Hanukkah, the Jewish holiday, is a sort of two-dimensional holiday. Um, Christmas goes one dimension up. We've got a three-dimensional holiday for Christmas. Um, so uh, the point is, so, you know, you get a partridge and a pear tree on the first day, but on the second day, we well, also get another partridge in a pear tree um, and the two turtle doves. Um, so already you've got this kind of little stack uh, coming up. And then uh, on the partridge in the pear tree, two turtle doves and the three uh, French hens. So uh, already you've got um, kind of you've got three uh, partridges down there. So you can see what happens. It, you actually are building up these triangles um, until you get um, a, a kind of like actually a sort of pyramid effect. So. Um, if it's 12 days of Christmas, actually what you've got to do is to count um, things in this kind of pyramid. So this is a, um, a triangular-based pyramid, so we call these the tetrahedral numbers. Um, so how many, so you've got 12 layers of this. Is there some clever way to work out how many, you know, I could count them all up, but I'm rubbish at mental arithmetic and I made some mistake. And, um, um, so is there some clever way to find out how many there are? Because I remember what we did, we took, uh, with the triangles, we took two triangles and put them together and we can make a rectangle, and then that's easy to count. Well, the wonderful thing is that you can do the same thing with these tetrahedrons. So this time you need six tetrahedrons. Uh, so this is what we're trying to add up. Those are the, um, all, all the triangular numbers. But you can put six of these kind of pyramids together into a box, which then has 12 along one side, 13 along the other, and 14 up uh, the top. So actually this gives you a, another clever way, a three-dimensional way, to see how many boxes you'll need in total. So we take uh, 12 times 13 times 14 divided by 6. Uh, and the rather remarkable thing is you've got a, a present for every day of the year except for Christmas. Um, <laughs> so 364 presents um, I inside there. So, um, uh, so actually, so we've got, you know, it's quite a nice um, little trick for that. Um, so a three-dimensional holiday, that's great. Um, and, and here's um, how far I have to go in promoting science um, uh, across the, uh, the university. The Daily Telegraph got me to, to, to explain this problem, and um, the editor brought along a Santa kit uh, outfit, which I had to dress up in. So, um, the, uh, so there's me trying to calculate um, how many presents there are. But I thought, you know, uh, let, let's go really geeky, and let's have our own sort of um, a holiday. Um, so I thought, you know, what, uh, so you've got a two-dimensional Jewish holiday, three-dimensional. Why don't we have a sort of four-dimensional holiday. Um, so I sort of started to think about a 4D festive celebration of science. Um, so if you think about it, actually, uh, the triangles is a kind of single summation. You're adding up a, a, a sum of things. But the, tri the pyramid numbers, it's a sum of sums, because we're adding up the triangles, which are themselves sums. So actually, to make a four-dimensional holiday, um, what we've got to do, is, I mean, we can do a sort of song for this. So I, I was trying to think on, so I've called it uh, Science Mass. So on the first day of science mass, my geek friend sent to me, well, I thought a boson in the LHC seemed quite good. So um, that's fine. But now we're going to go to the second day of science mass. Um, and I have to do a kind of sum of a sum of a sum to get this to be a 4D holiday. Um, so, uh, so on the second day of science mass, my geek friend sent to me, so I've gone 
It's gone for two twin primes and a boson in the LHC. But in order to make it 4D, I have to add that on again. So we had a, another repeat of a boson in the LHC. And this way, if we do this, we'll build up a thing where the number of uh, scientific things we'll get um, will, will be, have to be, a four, we'll have four dimensional boxes that we'll be putting together. So there's a challenge for you. I want to work out, um, so I decided um, how many days should uh, science maths have? Well, it should be a prime number, because I'm obsessed with primes. Um, uh, so I've said it's going to have 13 days. So um, I actually s sent out a sort of request across Twitter for people to come up with things for all of the um, 13 days of science maths. So, so, here, so we had the Higgs boson, which there, we would think there's one. There might be more than one, of course, actually. Uh, we're not sure. Twin primes, three laws of motions, uh, four pairing bases, five platonic solids, six quarks are spinning, seven base units measuring, eight bits are biting, uh, nine Higner numbers prime generating, 10 Rorschach ink blots di uh, diagnosing, 11 dimensions are stringing, 12 astronauts moonwalking, um, and 13 Neptune moons in orbiting. Um, so there, there's the challenge for you. You now have to work out how many of these things you get over the 13 days of Christmas using four-dimensional uh, pyramids. Um, so uh, there, there's a challenge. Or you can send me, if you think there are some better choices for your ones, I'm quite happy to get them through Twitter uh, if you think some of those are a bit rubbish. But, um um, so you can see you know, there are lots of good uh, maths already in some of the songs and the festivities we're singing. But of course, this is a time of year when um, uh, it's really party time. And party time, uh, there's also some great maths in parties. Um, uh, so one of the things about parties is that, especially at Christmas, everyone seems to get off with each other. Um, and, and so uh, uh, the challenge is, well, OK, if they are going to get off with each other, uh, can we get the pairings to work such there isn't some dreadful breakdown in the office um, uh, after everyone's sort of paired up and people are unhappy because they wanted to go off with somebody else? Um, so actually, maths has come up with a great um, uh, algorithm Algorithm in order to, you know, if you've got a party and you want to pair people up, such that everybody um, will be, uh, the, 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 all of the pairings will be stable. Um, so I thought I'd show you how this works. This is a wonderful algorithm. So, um, so I'm going to need some volunteers for this. So we're going to have eight people at my party. So um, I need four um, boys and four girls, basically. So can I have four volunteers? And we're going to try and show you how this mathematical algorithm works up so, so everything is uh, kind of stable. So yeah, OK, that's good. Well, I'll have one here. Yeah, you can come up. Excellent. Yeah, good. Right. Yeah, back there. Uh, so I think that, yes. Hand up there, great. You want to come up? Excellent, good. Uh, so let's uh, let's bring you up. And um, so if the boys, you take a king, um, and you go over there, and the girls, you take a queen, and you come over here. So yeah, if you want to come up, great. We'll see how we're doing. So you're going to take uh, you take the king of diamonds. Um, so we've got right. So we've got all my boys. Okay. So two two more girls I need. Yeah, great, excellent. And there, right, good. Yeah, no, they're, they're, you're absolutely you're great. Um, so let's see. So we got. Um, uh, I'm going to put them in order. I, I play uh, a lot of poker. So, um, so King of Spades, I'm going to put you here, and King of Diamonds, I'm going to put you here. Excellent. So we'll have you in the order, um, and then Queen of Spades right at the end. So that's good. Uh, if you could swap round, poker order goes like that. Excellent. Right. Um, so what I got is on each of the sides. So, so the, 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 they basically ordered such that um, uh, they're given a little order here about the, the, you know, who they fancy. Um, so here we got, so um, let's see the king of spades. Um, so let's see, you all first choice, you really fancy, oh yeah, let's make sure we get this the right way around. There's a trouble with symmetry. Um, so yeah, make sure your cards are, yeah, exactly. Um, so the and your ones are down this side, so yeah, good. So you want to turn yours that way, excellent. Right, so, so you really fancy the Queen of Diamonds. Okay, that one there. Uh, yeah, um, okay, but, and, and which one? Uh, you really don't want to end up with the Queen of Spades. Yeah, okay, so, so that's the kind of order we got here. Well, let's see what you, you know, what's, what's your kind of um, wish. So the Queen of Spades here. Oh, gosh, your first choice is the King of Spades. You really want to, well, that ain't going to happen, is it? Um, uh, uh, so then you've got the King of Diamonds, uh, King of Hearts, and the King of Clubs right down there is the one you really don't want to end up with. So the challenge here is can we find a way with all of these preferences um, to pair everyone up so that uh, nobody will run off with somebody else because there's a better option for them. You see, what would happen if we, um, so let's pair up, um, so we're going to do the King of Spades and the Queen of Spades. So if you'd like to come to the front here, let's suppose we, uh, so you're going to pair up there, and then we'll have the King of Hearts and the Queen of Hearts. So King of Hearts, if you come down here, 
Um, let's see, we're gonna, suppose we paired them up like this. Why wouldn't this work? Well, the trouble is that um, the, you know, we've already seen the king of spades really doesn't want to be with the queen of spades, but he wants to run off. He'd be quite happy. He'd be quite happy. Yeah, second choice on his is the queen of hearts. But what about the queen of hearts? I mean, queen of hearts may not like the king of spades. Actually, well, you've been paired with the king of hearts. That's your bottom choice. King of spades, sorry, king of hearts. King of spades is the next one up. So actually, you'd be quite happy to run off. So both of you, if we tried to pair this off, we, we'd have a disaster. They'd run away with each other. So that would just, just wouldn't work, OK? So you want to go back to your places. So here's the challenge is, is there a way to pair these up such that nobody run, will run off with somebody else um, in this thing? Maybe there isn't a way to do this. Maybe it's always some instability. If you think about rock, paper, scissors, you know, always there's something which beats something else, and it, you can never make it work such as something is sort of stable. Um, well, there is a way to do this. And uh, so the way to do this is to get, um, so let's put those back. Um, so the, the algorithm that, was, uh, that uh, was come up with is that the, the queens all propose to your first choice king. So uh, look at the, all the ones on the top of your list. What I want you to do is go and stand in front of the one that you would really like. Okay, so off you go. Let's see. I can't remember, who's the, who's the Darcy of this kind of outfit? Um, I think, oh yeah, they all want to, yeah, most of them want to be... <laughs> Yeah, look at him, isn't he cute? Wow, yeah, it's the hat, I think, which does it. So look at them, they're buzzing around. Uh, these two girl, poor guys are like, no, nobody wants us. But, oh, at least you, so you've got uh, somebody's proposed to you, so that's fine. OK, but what do we do about this lot, OK? Well, basically, you, 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 you get to choose. So, um, uh, so who's your top choice? Queen of Diamonds, yeah, OK. So I'm afraid the other two get rejected. So have you come? Have you, so yeah, so you can get the Queen of Diamonds for the moment. So the other two come here. You've got to find something else to do. So um, all right, OK, so, so that's the first round of this. So we've seen the first round, but the two of them have got rejected. Um, so these are provisional pairings. But now, um, OK, so first choice you're not going to get. So let's go for your second choice. OK, so if you want to go and uh, propose to your second choice. Um, so let's see where they go. I think we get. Um, ooh, now, so, so, uh, <laughs> it may work. <laughs> um, great. Oh, poor old King of Hearts is kind of like, um, shucks, I've not got anybody. But now you, you've got a choice now. That's great. So, so you've got Queen of Hearts and Queen of Clubs. So which one do you like? Oh, that one! Oh, wow! I'm sorry, you've got to come away then. So that, that, is a, that didn't last, did it? Gosh. Well, OK, so <laughs> you come over here. Um, so you've got, just got rejected. Um, so let's uh, reject you. OK, so now, so you, uh, King of Clubs is your top choice, so, uh, but you've got the King of Diamonds. So you could pro go and propose to the King of Diamonds. OK, let's see where the King of Diamonds... Oh, oh, right now, King of Diamonds is... Gone. Come on, barely see the King of Diamonds. <laughs> yeah, he's, there he is. All right, OK. Um, so now, let's see which one do you prefer. So your top choice is Queen of, Queen of Hearts. You've got your top choice. So yeah, you're, you're going to reject this one here. OK. <laughs> oh, dear. It's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we got this one now. So right, so you just got rejected again. Right, that's, <laughs> God, that's two rejections. So we're right down here. OK. King of Hearts. OK, so now you propose a way to the King of Hearts. Finally, the King of Hearts gets Lux out. Um, so. Uh, and now everyone is paired up with a single person. And this algorithm, if you carry this algorithm on, um, it means that uh, you can prove that this will lead to a stable pairing, such that now if anybody looks and sees, well, I actually would prefer somebody else, but they have got somebody who's better than the one who's proposing. So, so we find now that nobody is going to run off with anyone else. Even though they might not have got their top choice, they can't offer somebody else who would say, well, no, I'm, I'm already with somebody I prefer than you. So, so this algorithm works. Now, the intriguing thing is we could have done this the other way around. We could have started with the kings proposing all to the queens. Um, uh, does anyone think, do you think that would give a different uh, answer to the way these were paired? Put your hand up if you think it would lead to the same answer. Yeah, possibly could. Who thinks it actually might lead to a different answer? It's kind of even split there. Actually, it does lead to a different answer. Not always, but very often. So it matters which order, you know, is it the women proposing to the men or the men proposing to the women? Um, I think in this way, uh, the men luck out. They get the best that they could possibly get, and the women get the worst that they could possibly get. Um, but if we did it the other way around, it would swap over. So the women would get the best that they could possibly get out of this, and the men would not do so well. OK, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, uh, thank you very much. You pop your cards on the front there.
So this is actually um, an algorithm uh, that was come up with for, for trying to solve this problem. It's called the stable marriage problem. Uh, and it's uh, uh, one of the only algorithms uh, ever to win a Nobel Prize. So Gail and Shapley um, came up with this. Gail had already died, but uh, uh, Shapley won the 2012 Nobel Prize in economics for coming up with this algorithm. And it's a very a powerful algorithm that can be used in a lot of different circumstances. One of the first was sort of pairing up, um, uh, not, not at a party like this, but um, students applying to uh, placements at university. Um, and, and interestingly, the way they applied the algorithm, of course, the universities knew what they were doing, they made the students um, propose to the universities. So the universities got the best that they could, and the students got the worst that they could do. The students suddenly worked this out after a while, and said, this case isn't fair. So now they flipped it over. So the students, uh, the, the university is now proposed to the students. So the students get the best possible result out of this. Um, uh, so, uh, but another interesting place is used in the NHS um, by uh, and America as well. Uh, kidney um, transplants. Um, very often you might have a partner who's quite happy to give their kidney, but they don't match. Um, and then the problem is uh, you've got to find somebody who does match, but why would they give you their kidney? Um, and uh, so if you've got just two, it's very simple. If you could find two and they'd be quite happy to swap over um, and uh, donate a kidney to somebody else if their partner will donate a kidney, which will save their partner. Um, so that's it's quite simple, but this matching algorithm, if you look at the number of people who are prepared to give kidneys across the country, or in America, for example, it can get quite complicated trying to match these up. And this, uh, a similar sort of algorithm has been used, and I think the longest one um, was uh, at this particular chain of people here who were managed to be matched up. Um, so this algorithm is actually saving lives uh, in order to be able to find uh, the right match for somebody, which I think is quite amazing. Um, well, algorithms, of course, are all over the place, and algorithms uh, are at the heart of, uh, of, of how I find my uh, Christmas presents to give people, actually, because, uh, you know, I, basically, I don't know what to do, so I, I, I type into a search engine and say, what's the best Christmas present you could give to somebody? Um, and this is the amazing thing. I mean, Google is, I, I think, one of the most extraordinary algorithms. Uh, it's like, almost like magic. I mean, it, uh, but of course, it's not magic. It's not elves there sort of saying, oh, what the, I love you. It's just a really amazing piece of mathematics uh, that is at the heart of finding out what the best website is um, uh, for, for the present that um, uh, you want to give. Um, so I, I thought I'd do a little demonstration to explain how this algorithm works. Um, so let, let's suppose we've got, um, say, three uh, websites uh, that um, uh, they're offering presents for Christmas, and we're going to try and order and see which one is the, the, the sort of uh, most popular, which one is the most uh, likely one that I should go to for this. So um, you may know that this Google algorithm works on the basis of the fact that it's the links between websites which actually rank the order of the websites. But how does this work? So suppose that I had um, this particular way of linking. So suppose that website A um, also recommends both website B and website C. So there's a link from website A to website B and website C. Um, website B only links to website, so website B only links to website C, and website C only links to website A. Um, now, with this particular uh, setup, which do you think uh, Google is going to put right at the top as the most popular? We're going to do a little vote, okay? So you can, you can put your hand up in a, a second. So um, to, who thinks that website A is going to end up at the top of the pile um, with the Google ranking, with this particular way that the network is connected. So put your hand up if you think uh, uh, website A should be the one which will be at the top of the list. So we've got some votes for A, a few votes for A. Okay, who thinks that website B is the one that's going to go top uh, of the pile? Few, much fewer there. Uh, okay, who thinks website C? It's, oh, lots of you going for C. That's interesting. OK. Um, so how does Google work this out? Um, well, basically, uh, the idea is that, yeah, uh, Google is very clever because it's quite hard um, to uh, kind of boost your own website's ranking in this. There's not much you can do. You've got to wait for other people to link to you. And that's the importance of, of how the Google algorithm works. Um, so I, I need three volunteers who are going to come up and be my websites for me. And we're going to do a little, yeah, it's a great, you can come up. Um, and who else? It's, um, it's very mechanical. You don't have to do much maths. You just have to, uh, great, excellent. We'll have one there. Um, one more. Yes, why don't you come? Great. Uh, so, so let me show you how this algorithm works. Okay, so I'm going to give, uh, we're going to give each website a kind of equal amount of value right at the beginning. Okay, so do you want to be website A? 
Oh, you've got a, a Ruby Redford t-shirt. Excellent. All right. Yeah, no, I'm very, have you read the recent Ruby Redford? It's, uh, that, I, I do the codes for Lauren Child's Ruby Redford books. Um, and uh, I'm really proud of my code for this one. So each book is about a different uh, uh, sense. And so we, we did one about taste this time. So I did this amazing four-dimensional code for that one. Anyway, so, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, I'm getting, all right, so you can be website B and we, 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 we website C. So we're going to put website B over here. Um, okay, so I've given them equal value at the moment. So how does the Google algorithm work to, to see which one's the best? So um, I'm going to put these pots down here. So you're a. Um, so essentially, what you do is you share your value. Uh, if you link to a website, several websites, you have to share your value between those websites. Um, so for example, you've got each of you got eight balls inside here. Um, so you link to both of these websites. So you've got to share your balls between uh, four balls to website B and four balls to website C. Okay? Um, but you, you only link to one website. So you will link to website C. So you're going to give all your value to website C. Okay? And the same for you. you. You link to website A. You're giving all your balls to website A. So what, basically what we're going to do is to run this and see how the value gets distributed among the website. So um, let's, off you go. You, uh, so the pot's there. So you're going to go to the pot and fill up um, the other person's pot with the value. So um, let's open these up. So all of them. Um, so you're giving four balls each, but all of your balls are going into that one. And all of yours have gone into there, but half, half. Um, so on the first round, we distributed um, uh, the balls. So, so half have gone here from the website A, but they've swapped all of theirs over. So now the, uh, the uh, um, value has been distributed. And you can see that uh, website B, not, not many of you went for website B. And that's kind of right, because it's not getting much value on this round. But at the moment, website C, you've got um, uh, 10 balls inside there. So you're being highly valued at the moment. But that, that's not, not one round isn't good enough, so we need to run it again. So let's um, do exactly the same thing again. So take the balls, so put the empty ones down, take the ones that you've got uh, filled up, and you do the same thing again. So you're equally distributing your balls, and you're distributing them it's all to one website. So off you go. Um, let's uh, open these up. Um, so what happens now? Is website C still going to stay ahead? Um, well, well, after we've done this one, uh, website B has got a little bit... It's, it's still pretty low, but website C has gone down now, and website A has gone up. Um, so uh, now it's not clear quite whether you know which one is it, website B or website C. So uh, website A. So uh, so website C or website A. So let's do it one more time. Let's uh, distribute. So, so so basically, this algorithm, first of all, is just keeps on distributing. So off you go again. Let's redistribute them. Where do they go? Um, okay. So uh, now, yes, yeah, so you put half there and um, we'll mix those in. So again, it's, uh, after that round, website B has gone up a bit, actually. So, so you know, is this thing ever going to stabilize, or is it just sort of ping-ponging all around? And th this is the kind of challenge of this. So I think, am I doing one more round? Uh, yeah, let's do one more round, see what happens. Um, uh, so this is the kind of uh, the, what the algorithm is doing. So off you go, share them around. But what we want to do is, does this stabilize after a while? If we kept on doing this, would one website, uh, would the websites kind of uh, um, uh, stabilize? Well, at the moment, that's, uh, we seem to have got equal value for website A and website C. Um, and that's the interesting thing, is how can you work out mathematically without going through this thing over and over again until you see some sort of stability? Um, well, this is actually a really powerful piece of mathematics, because um, uh, essentially, each time I'm doing this, I've got a little, uh, so uh, th this is the hardest bit of maths I'm going to do, but there's a little matrix. Um, so the number of balls that are at, at a website A, B, and C, um, when we do this round and we redistribute, basically it's the way this matrix acts on this uh, little column vector gives us the new distribution of balls. But I want to know, is there a way of distributing the balls such that the thing is actually uh, stable, such that it, it doesn't keep on changing each time? And this is actually a really powerful piece of maths called um, finding the eigenvalue of a matrix. So uh, actually, and this is at the heart of many things like quantum physics, um, uh, it's about eigenvalues. So we want to know, is there a way of distributing those balls um, such that when we uh, redistribute, they don't change ever? Um, and in this case, actually, we distributed them with um, uh, two-fifths to website A, two-fifths to website website C and a fifth to website B, um, then this distribution would actually stabilize. And so this is actually how Google works. It looks for um, the way that the websites are linked together, and then uh, what's the weighting to give to each website such that when I do this redistributing, um, I, I don't actually uh, get any change. So there's this amazing thing, eigenvalues and matrices basically
basically at the heart of how Google works. Um, so if we change that and I put uh, do 0 0.4, 0 0.4, so let's change that to, yeah, so we've got a distribution of uh, two fifths, two fifths, and one fifth. Um, if we ran the websites again and, and did the little algorithm we did here, we'd see that the thing would stabilize. And those are the values, the, the ranks that are given to each particular website. Um, OK, let's give our websites a round of applause. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Or you can leave those. So the interesting thing is that um, uh, your intuition that uh, C was actually the most powerful, and because it seems to be being linked to uh, by both the other websites, um, but actually both C and A are equally valued um, uh, with this particular um, uh, ranking. And and it's quite I get uh, asked actually quite a lot by advertisers now. Um, you know, advertising companies used to be um, overrun by people doing English literature because they wanted good copy and sort of. Um, but now advertising firms are full of mathematicians who are trying to reverse engineer the Google algorithm um, because uh, they basically want to f put their um, product right at the top of the ranking. Um, and so, you know, this is pretty public, but actually the real mechanics of Google, there's a lot of hidden things because they don't want people um, kind of reverse engineering it and finding a way to get their website at the top. One way, the other thing I get a lot of approaches is, will you link your website here at the Maths Institute to my website? Because actually, some of the places with the highest page rank across the world are universities. So Oxford University has one of the highest page rank because a lot of you know we have a lot of value. A lot of people are linking to us, and it boosts our page rank. So if I then link to somebody else, I'm giving them a lot of these balls and a lot of value. So um, so it's interesting uh, that uh, you know uh, of course as the more I do that, the more I'll uh, I'll sort of water down uh, the particular value. But um, it's interesting that people are coming to me because I have powerful page rank because of uh, my place at this university and that will actually boost their page rank as well. Um, so this, uh, of course, was discovered by um, these two geeky mathematicians, Paige and Bryn, in their, uh, in their garage um, in uh, the west coast of America and just uh, using this simple tool of eigenvalues of matrices, um, they've been able to um, make their, their billions, basically. So um, I think it's a, 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 a wonderful example of pure maths, eigenvalues were considered rather pure. I think the, the idea of the dark side and the light side, you know, this uh, is, is really disappearing. The amount of pure mathematics that are now being, popping up in uh, uh, sort of an applied area, kind of area like this um, really shows there's really no difference between us. Um, so the hope is, of course, that when you put in, uh, you know, a best birthday present, uh, what will pop up is uh, uh, maybe Amazon recommending a copy of my book. In fact, um, this, is, this is what happened to me. Um, uh, so sometimes these algorithms don't really work because um, uh, I got this letter um, a couple of days ago, um, saying, Dr. De Sotoy, maybe you'd like these, these uh, books. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 I do like those books. Uh, 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 so they recommended three copies of my books. And that's one of the troubles. Uh, some of the times these algorithms really just, you know, because they're not, you know, they, you know, you could have done this to make sure I didn't get copies. I don't mind being recommended copies of my books. But, um, but sometimes some, some kinds of these algorithms can do some weird things. Um, uh, so it's an interesting example of a book. Uh, it wasn't a very popular book, um, but when uh, this uh, person put it in, he was interested in this book for his uh, PhD, um, he put this book in. It was uh, um, The Making of a Fly, The Genetics of Animal Design. Um, so you know there are second-hand books on Amazon, um, and uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, there's prices. So, so some of these second-hand bookshops, they use algorithms to generate uh, the price of these books. Now, when he looked, searched this book, he got a big surprise because the book was on one website for a million dollars, 7,130,000, ,000, and on another website, over two million dollars. He said, this is really weird. And he, he wrote to Peter Lawrence, he said, do you know, you know your book is uh, selling? You know, why is it selling for so much? He didn't know either. Um, so this guy uh, came back a few days later to see, you know, maybe uh, it had sorted itself out. Um, two days later, uh, the thing had gone up. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one bookshop was offering it for 18 million. Wow, this, you know, this, this amazing um, uh, book this must be. That, uh, and the other one, 23 million. I wish somebody would buy my book for 23 million dollars. Um, uh, so, so what was happening here? Uh, what was going wrong that somehow, uh, weirdly, you know, why were they competing with each other to, to um, uh, sell this book? Um, 
Well, uh, actually, the guys started to analyze um, what was happening over each of the days. And um, uh, he saw, basically, there was a multiplier going on. So, so each website was looking at each other. And they were using the price of the other website um, in order to uh, determine the price that they put their book on. Um, so uh, Prof. Nath, for example, was always trying to undercut um, the other one, you know, basically, well, if you want to buy there, but we got it a little cheaper. Um, and, and, but weirdly, Bawdy Books was uh, slightly overpricing their book. Um, uh, and of course, the, the way they'd weighted it meant that um, uh, the, the cumulative effect was that actually the book was being pushed up and up. And nobody was wanting to buy this book. It was really, uh, so, so nobody had noticed that this thing was just over time. It, it, I mean, it's an exponential growth. It doesn't take too long to blow this book up to, to the price here. Um, now, here's Here's a question for you. Uh, okay, you can understand why Pronath were wanting to undercut, you know, so okay, well, well, we'll make it a little cheaper than the other bookshops, so you can understand that. But what's going on with the other bookshop? Why are they actually got their algorithm uh, making the book a little bit more expensive than the other website? Anyone got I any ideas why? Yeah. D d that, exactly, that could be one reason. You know, you think, oh god, a really cheap one. Yeah, and maybe the other one's got a higher quality. You know, it's got you know, everyone's ranking it. So maybe you'll go. Oh no, I'd rather trust the person, pay a little bit more. And it was only a little bit of a factor. So that's one idea. But actually, it turned out that probably wasn't the reason. You got an idea? Um, that Audiobook listed it first, and the other person thought I can sell that for cheaper. Yeah, but then why? Bawdy Books has actually got their algorithm always looking at the other website and multiplying it a little bit more. So, so over time, they're, they're, that's right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe they just wanted to mess with everyone. Well, they, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they certainly succeeded. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, they're not, um, nobody's going to pay, pay 23 million for that book. Uh, my thought was that Bawdy Books didn't have a copy of Making the Fly. They didn't have a copy, so they just kept on looking at the other one and said, okay, if anyone orders from us, we buy their book. <laughs> but if we buy their book, we need to be a little bit more so we can pay for it to be delivered, and, and then we send it on. So we need to crank it up a little bit, and um, uh, so I think that's what was happening. They didn't have that book at all, and they needed to have a little multiplying factor, but it ended up, you know, with um, it, it costing 23 million. But, um, uh, so, and that's the trouble with these algorithms. Sometimes they just aren't sensitive to kind of weird sort of anomalies happening. And, and this happens in the stock market. So um, there was this amazing thing which happened. Um, so th there are a lot of algorithms at work in, in the stock market, which uh, um, essentially, you know, you want something which is acting much faster than a human brain uh, or, or can, can react. And so when things change, it automatically does something. Um, th th these algorithms that are in the stock market, th th we think that they were probably responsible for a rather remarkable flash crash that happened um, um, uh, on the 6th of May 2010, when in about um, in a couple of minutes, um, the, the value of the stock market just absolutely crashed. Um, because these algorithms are working faster than anybody um, uh, could react to, and they just sort of basically the same thing happened, but instead of escalating the price of that Amazon book, it, it basically just crashed the whole thing. And uh, you know, people were just going crazy. You know, this is one person's reaction to seeing, well, what, what the hell is happening? It was a, but within very quickly, the whole thing had picked up again. Um, and it seems now that there was somebody uh, sitting uh, in in, in West London with his parents actually his house and he created these algorithms to basically just um, uh, uh, sort of manipulate the market a little bit these, but these algorithms eventually um, uh, led to this flash crash and he's I think still waiting um, uh, trial uh, for actually manipulating the markets in this way with these algorithms although it's not clear whether he knew the effect that they would have so there are interesting questions coming up now with these algorithms whether actually um, you know who's if you write an algorithm, are you responsible um, uh, for, for the effects of that algorithm? Um, which, of course, you, I mean, you, you, you still are, I think. So, um, just to warn you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, uh, the, the the challenge I actually said in my my the title of my talk was this traveling Santa problem. So, this is, I think, one of my favourites. Is you know, Santa um, has this great challenge uh, on Christmas Eve of having to find um, his way across the whole of the planet, delivering all of these presents um, uh, down uh, chimneys. Um, and so 
you know, how, how does he manage to do this? He has to find the most efficient path uh, to, to deliver all of these presents. Um, there's this wonderful thing now. Have you gone on Google on Christmas Eve and you can see where, where Santa is on any particular uh, moment? So um, here, here's, uh, he caught him on the top of Mount Everest delivering. Um, uh, so, you know, the challenge is, you know, you're going across the, the, the planet. Is there an efficient way um, to find uh, the, the, the shortest path so um, he, he can get around all of the chimneys? Um, so I've sent you a little challenge. When you came in, you've got um, uh, Santa's Grotto there um, and uh, various cities um, that they have to visit. Um, so I don't know whether you've been having a, a go at this. Um, but the idea is you start at Santa's Grotto and you've got to visit each of the chimneys in turn um, and, and then come back to Santa's Grotto. Um, and, and the challenge is, can you find the shortest path around this? Now, I've been telling you about these wonderful algorithms to match people up, wonderful algorithms um, uh, to find you presence on, on, on Google. But this represents a real challenge to mathematicians because we cannot find an efficient algorithm other than trial and error. I mean, basically, I, I've got a lot of you here. If you all tried trying to find a path around here, we probably would find one which was minimal. But basically, there's no kind of efficient way to see um, how to find the shortest route here. I mean, uh, why, you can have a go at this um, uh, as, uh, uh, to see whether you can find uh, the shortest path, and we'll see whether anybody comes up with it. Um, the trouble is that the only thing we really know how to do is to try one path after another and just see, try all the different paths and see which one comes out the smallest. But that, you know, it just is a very inefficient way to do it. And the more and more cities you have to visit, um, the more different possibilities there are around this network. Um, and so, poor Santa's got a lot more than this to, to visit. So this is an example of a problem. Um, in fact, it's one of these millennial problems, so um, uh, called the NP versus P problem. And these problems are, have the particular quality that um, once you kind of find a solution. So suppose you want to find a, a path around there which has a sort of um, a, which is less than say 240 miles or something. Once you've found one, you know you've, uh, you've you've found a path. But trying to find a path which is say less than 240 uh, miles requires just uh, searching for the needle in the haystack. So there are a lot of these problems out there which have this quality that um, to, in order to find the most efficient solution, you've just got to try sort of one after another after another. But when you find it, you can prove very quickly that it is the, the fastest solution. So in fact, we don't know whether there's a very efficient algorithm to find this path. And this is um, one of the challenges. So it's, we have these seven millennial problems. So the businessman in America, Landon Clay, offered a million dollars to anybody who could solve one of these seven problems. So uh, one has already been solved. It's called the Poincaré conjecture. Um, uh, this is the, my third book was about some of these problems. So the other one is uh, the Riemann hypothesis about primes. Um, but the, this problem many regard as perhaps the most important because it has so many applications um, uh, to the real world around us. So the NP versus P problem is basically, can you find an efficient algorithm to find the, the shortest path around uh, Santa's network? Um, or can you prove that there is isn't one other than by trying uh, all of them out and seeing which is the smallest. The intriguing thing is that there are many problems which have this quality to them. So um, one of my favorite is the, um, uh, the premiership problem. Um, so uh, you, you might detect here that I'm an Arsenal supporter because I took this little freeze frame before Leicester beat Chelsea uh, and went back on the top of the uh, Premiership. So this is a small moment a um, uh, couple of days ago when we were still top. Um, uh, but the challenge here is, well, can you work? Poor old Aston Villa, who we um, beat at the weekend, um, uh, are right down there at the bottom. But is it still technically possible for Aston Villa to win the Premiership? Um, so what is the challenge there? It means that, okay, well, uh, Aston Villa basically got to win all their games, okay? But is that enough? Because there are other teams who will be winning games or drawing, uh, and maybe there's, it's a bit like the uh, stable marriage problem. Is there a way to distribute um, the, the wins and losses and draws such that Aston Villa will stay top with all of their wins and we can make sure that no other team beats them? Weirdly, uh, so uh, many years ago when I was young, uh, you used to get two points for a win and one point each when you drew. 
Uh, this meant that actually uh, at the end of the season, uh, you know the total number of points in the division because um, uh, it didn't really matter whether it was a win or a draw or, or, or a loss. Um, uh, it was basically, uh, you know, everyone would be, uh, those two points would be distributed around. But then something changed. The Premiership decided, okay, now we want to incentivize people to win, um, and they changed it. So you get three points for a win, and only uh, one each if you draw. So now at the end of the season, we don't know how many of the total points will be. If everyone drew all their games, it would be as small as possible. If there were no draws, it would be much bigger. The weird thing is that um, before we did this change, there was an efficient algorithm to work out whether Aston Villa um, would actually have a possibility to win the Premiership. But with the change from two points for a win to three points for a win, suddenly this changed and we no longer have an efficient algorithm. In fact, this has the same quality as the travelling Santa problem, that uh, essentially you've just got to try all the different possibilities of results and see whether there's one which will make sure that Aston Villa will stay top. And so all of these problems, uh, uh, there are various different uh, versions of them. So there's a one about Minesweeper. Um, there's another one, sort of another coming back to the party problem. If you're staging several parties across the Christmas season uh, and you know that there are people who really don't like each other and you've got to invite, invite them to different parties. So for, for example, suppose you cannot invite somebody to the same party if they're linked to the, the other person to that party. So Fran and Ian, we can't invite to the same party because they hate each other. Um, so the challenge is, you know, can we find a way to have as, uh, you know, as few parties as possible such that nobody is coming to a party with somebody that they hate? Um, uh, so this, this is another version. It seems to be you can only just try um, uh, different ways of uh, uh, giving, doing the invites. Um, there's another version of this, uh, which is kind of interesting, which is, uh, so you probably know this thing called the four-color map problem. Uh, Robin Wilson is here, he's written a wonderful book about the four-color map problem. Um, it's uh, this challenge of, you know, if you have any map, you can always get away with four colors um, to color that map, such that no countries uh, that have the same border will have the same color. But here's the challenge. Um, actually, could you get away with three? Is three colors enough? Um, so it, with any particular map, um, the, the challenge is, well, um, OK, I know, thanks to this proof, that four will suffice. But in this particular case, can I get away with three? Um, so uh, in, in this, so um, you, you might, so I think in this case, uh, um, you can't because uh, um, uh, Luxembourg has three countries around it. There's no way to colour those. But sometimes you can redivide the map such that there are three. So um, th the challenge of trying to work out whether there are um, three d uh, colours that will suffice is actually absolutely equivalent to the challenge of trying to work out whether you can do get away with inviting everyone to three parties. Um, because if you think about, suppose I try to see whether there were three parties that I could stage such that nobody um, here uh, would be invited to a party with somebody they hated. Well, that's exactly the same sort of problem. If I change these now from people to countries, um, actually it's the same problem as if I was trying to colour the map with three colours as opposed to four and make sure that no countries with the same border would have the same colour. And this is the amazing thing about all of these problems. Actually, if you can solve one of them, so if you can solve the travelling Santa problem, you end up actually finding an algorithm which will solve all of them. So we've managed to prove that all of these problems are actually equivalent. Um, so that uh, any solution to one of them, if you do the Minesweeper one or the Premiership one, you can use that algorithm to solve all of the others. So it's an extraordinary, so you only have to analyse one problem in order to be able to work this out. Now Santa is actually faced not only with um, the problem of uh, finding an efficient path um, uh, around the Earth, but there's another version of this which we're going to end with. So I need two volunteers from this side of the, the, the lecture theatre who are going to, great, if you can come up and one more volunteer from this side, excellent, great. So you're going to come down here um, uh, and two volunteers from this side who are going to compete against them in a little problem which is uh, rather, so um, any volunteers from this side? Great, yeah, and what, just need one more. Who's, you can bring your mate if you want. <laughs> okay, so the problem here is um, I, I've got, basically Santa has to find the most efficient way to pack his um, uh, sleigh uh, when he's setting off, and he try, has to try and get as many pro pro uh, 
um, uh, presence inside um, uh, as he can. Um, so th the challenge here is I've got different sorts of sizes of packages. Uh, now the length of the, each lorry um, is uh, 150 uh, meters long, and you have to find, is there a way to choose these presents such you can fill the whole of the lorry? OK, um, so we've got a little timer here. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds and uh, see who can find um, the most efficient uh, way of filling this. And you mustn't overfill it. You can underfill it, of course, but it, the, the sleigh won't move. So we're going to go with 30 seconds uh, starting now. And you can also kind of have a go at this, see whether you can find, is there a way to find those boxes such that uh, you add them up and you can get up to exactly 150? Or what's the closest you can get? You mustn't go over 150. Um, OK, so that's, uh, you've got 15 seconds left. Um, so uh, basically, uh, you've got to find, uh, so many different ways I can stack these up. So we've got uh, seven, five, four, three, two, one. And stop there. OK, so let's see. Let's see what we've got. So, um, right. Are you, no, are you, 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 you've got to come. You've got, you, you, you've got to stick them on. Yeah, yeah, you can't start changing now. OK, let's see. What we, oh, it's, uh, interestingly, so, um, so this one is, is a draw here because they've got 52, 59, and 27, which fits, but it isn't maximizing the thing. So 30 seconds, well, because you could have got the whole length. So you've got a little bit left here. Um, OK, so um, and this side here, you also went for 52, 59, and 27. Um, so did anyone manage to get a different way which got a little bit more efficient? Yes, sir. OK, let's, and that adds up exactly to 150. So well done. Exactly. But this is the real uh, But this is the interesting thing, because here I just asked two, two people to do it, and they had to try all the different possibilities. They didn't get, um, uh, you know, they, in, interestingly, obviously you're using the same sort of algorithm. I mean, one of these algorithms is, you know, well, just put the biggest one in first, and then you find, well, that's not really good, and so you go for the next biggest one down, um, maybe. Uh, but if I ask all of you, basically you're working a bit like everyone trying something different, and it was not unexpected that maybe with the whole of you here, we would find one person, we'd find the most efficient one. But again, uh, this, we don't have an efficient algorithm to find. It seems such a simple problem, you know, just what's the way, most efficient way to pack the back of your van if, or the, the sleigh? Uh, and, and this is another version of this NP problem. So let's give our volunteers a round of applause. Thank you very much. So I think this season is just jam-packed with amazing maths. I mean, there was a, I thought oh, I could do snowflakes as well and tell you all about that. Um, um, but time has run out, so we come to the end of the lecture. This is um, so if you can find a, a solution to this, uh, an efficient way, and an algorithm, or prove that there isn't an algorithm, there is a million-dollar prize. And so um, uh, the travelling sales Santa problem, travelling salesman problem, as it's known. Um, did, it, who, did anyone get anything below 240? Yes. What did you get? 231? That's amazing. Did anyone? What, what did you get? 228. 228? If I've had it up Right, OK, yeah. So, uh, 228. Wow, you see, even I got it wrong, you see. So, uh, I thought I, 228 is even less than I said. So, uh, no, I did that one, so I probably had it. Oh, OK. <laughs> He's the true mathematician in the room. So, uh, so I, I thought it was 238, but that's the interesting thing. You see, I, I might well have missed a path around here um, that, uh, that will give you a, 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 a more efficient way. So um, anyway, if you want to find out more about some of these problems, I'm selling copies of my book, The Number Mysteries, uh, which uh, is about some of these millennial problems. Um, there, there were five problems. One's been solved. There's still four million pounds you can win if you buy a copy of the book. Um, anyway, thank you very much uh, uh, for coming along. And